Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour, bonjour. J'ai le plaisir aujourd'hui de modérer la dernière session plénière de cette semaine de conférence de ce congrès mondial des jardins botaniques, des jardins botaniques dans la société, des visions pour le futur. Cette septième session plénière est placée sur la, sous la thématique des enjeux climatiques et de l'implication pour la conservation et pour nos jardins botaniques. Après des discours magistraux sur la conservation, sur la génétique de la conservation, sur les services écosystémiques, sur la sécurité alimentaire, sur la dignité, le sens de la dignité des plantes, sur l'éducation environnementale, qui mieux que le professeur Martin Beniston euh, pouvait aujourd'hui aborder cette thématique des changements climatiques. Le professeur Martin Beniston dirige à l'Université de Genève l'Institut euh, des sciences environnementales et est un grand spécialiste des changements climatiques. Nous avons l'honneur de l'accueillir ce matin et il est un des récipiendaires du prix Nobel qui a été remis en 2007 au panel intergouvernemental sur les, ch les, ch euh, les changements climatiques. Merci, Monsieur Beniston, et c'est un grand honneur pour moi de vous introduire aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to give this uh, uh, final um, plenary lecture at this uh, meeting. And um, so I've heard a lot of people who have great expectations of this talk, so I'll try and be, uh, I try and honor those expectations. Anyway, just to start off, uh, just a word of uh, caution um, in the sense that um, we have made a lot of progress in the understanding of the climate system over the past uh, few years or decades, but we're still not really in a, in a position to actually be able to pinpoint at the level of an individual botanical garden uh, what climate change might actually uh, entail. However, we do, we do know that we uh, can uh, use uh, the, the, the different trends that we are uh, experiencing today and that we are projecting for the future Uh, at least on a regional scale, and I guess that kind of information could, of course, be of use in thinking through how botanical gardens might need to respond to a changing climate. And, of course, much can be inferred from the observed response of vegetation to current climate trends. And, of course, this can be transposed to the uh, level, to the very fine geographic scale of individual botanical gardens. So I'll start off with this... Um, Uh, well-known diagram, probably better known to you than to me, actually, the uh, well-known pyramid which uh, links uh, different climatic regimes around the globe to different biomes. So we have uh, on the vertical axis uh, temperature going from the <coughs> tropics to the polar regions, and uh, the horizontal axis would be the sort of moisture axis going from dry on the left to moist on the right. And, uh, of course, we have different... Um, Uh, climatic regimes that combine in subtle ways uh, these uh, temperature and humidity conditions. And of course, uh, uh, sustained change in climate, uh, essentially going through uh, increasing temperatures almost everywhere around the, gl around the globe, but with possible changes uh, in moisture, maybe more moisture as we'll see in a minute in some parts of the world, less in other parts of the world, might actually change quite substantially the, this rather uh, well-known picture that we've been uh, uh, you know, used to, at least over the past century. So what we're going to try and do over the next uh, few minutes is uh, just go through a little bit where we are today, where we might be going tomorrow, and then see how, this, how these changes in climate might actually impact upon different uh, forms of uh, vegetation and different biomes. So uh, I apologize in advance and if some of my conclusions related to vegetation and biomes might be a bit oversimplistic, I'm just a climatologist, right? So uh, observed changes in climate, I think uh, what you'll see here is fairly well known. This is uh, 
the uh, change in temperature or the, the anomalies, the differences of temperature with respect to a baseline, which would be the average 20th century uh, climate. So we go from the mid 19th century, rather cold, cooler than today. Uh, we have a first phase of warming in the early part of the 20th century through to around the 1940s, and then a hiatus uh, around the 1950s, 1960s, and then a second phase of very strong warming. Uh, indeed, the, the three warmest years on record, at least since we've uh, uh, been measuring uh, climate parameters uh, on a regular basis, uh, essentially from the beginning of the 19th century, the three warmest years are the three last years, 2014, 2015, 2016. <clears throat> now, this is a typical climatologist view of the world. We're looking at the change in the climate variable, the, in this instance, temperature, with respect to time. But for many non-experts, actually, this uh, notion that we've, we've seen a warming uh, climate over the past century, or a bit more of about one degree per century, might seem rather uh, trivial in a way, because, uh, for example, this morning, uh, it was maybe 12 degrees here in Geneva. It's going to go up maybe to 22, 23 degrees this afternoon. So in just one day, you have more than 10 or 12 degrees of uh, temperature change. So what is the significance, really, of one degree per century? So maybe another way of looking at this is uh, just to compare uh, different uh, statistics. Uh, so we're located in Geneva, and if we look at the uh, climate statistics, sort of joint temperature and, pres and uh, precipitation statistics uh, in the 1950s, where you see that in, in the summertime, the, these are summer statistics, uh, well, uh, temperatures were somewhere between 22 and 23 degrees on average and maybe three to four millimeters of precipitation per day, so roughly 300 millimeters of precipitation during the three months of the summer season. Now we can look at the statistics for another location, which is Toulouse, which is about 500 kilometers to the southwest of Geneva. And as one would intuitively expect, uh, Toulouse being further south, being maybe a bit closer to the Mediterranean, might actually have a, a warmer and possibly a drier climate. And indeed, this is what we see on this diagram. You see Toulouse in the 1950s, about 24 to 25 degrees on average during the summertime, and about one and a half millimeters of precipitation per day, so about half the precipitation uh, of uh, Geneva. Now let's have a look what the statistics of Geneva are in the past decade. So this is where we are today. You see that Geneva uh, today has roughly the same climate as Toulouse 50 or 60 years ago. And this is a systematic picture throughout Europe and in, indeed in most uh, mid-latitude countries. We can do the same in North America to a large extent. So uh, Toulouse today has the same climate as Madrid 50 years ago. Uh, Bordeaux today has the same climate as Liz Lisbon. So this is essentially one degree per century in terms of global uh, warming uh, translates into a sort of northward shift of climate uh, regimes that were up till now mostly confined to the Mediterranean region, even possibly North Africa, and then moving northwards into Central and ultimately into, nor into Northern Europe. <coughs> we can also see how climate has evolved uh, uh, on a global scale by looking at this animation that was uh, compiled by NASA, the, <coughs> not the <coughs> sorry, American Space uh, Administration. And what you're gonna see here uh, uh, in this animation Anything that is blue is colder than today, and anything that is sort of going towards yellow and red would be warmer than the average 20th century uh, climate. So as you'll see, it's a very noisy picture. It's the, there's no uniform warming around the globe. Some parts of the globe, as you will see, will, will be warming more than others. Uh, but what will be essentially spectacular are the last 10 or 15 years. So we start at the end of the 19th century, so you'll see the dates uh, going by. And you see on some occasions, Siberia warming up in the early uh, 1910s, uh, 1920s. And then we have this sort of hiatus period in the 40s, 50s, into the 1960s. And then as we move into the 70s and especially 80s and 90s, well, you see that the picture changes quite radically. We are definitely going into a world that is much warmer uh, than it was uh, a few decades ago. Now, do we already see changes in vegetation uh, in relation to changes, uh, these sort of changes in climate that I've just uh, shown you in the last uh, two or three slides? Of course, we have what is considered today to be a relatively uh, rapid rate of change in terms of climate compared to uh, 
uh, climate changes that we've uh, experienced or we've been able to reconstruct from the past. So we're looking at sort of decadal scale changes in climate, whereas in the past we were looking at more century to millennium uh, scale changes in climate. So of course, uh, many uh, types of vegetation might not have the capacity to respond to rapid rates of changes uh, in, in climate. They might be able to respond on very long time scales, but maybe less so on very short time scales. Well, the first uh, one is a famous um, uh, is a famous tree here in Geneva, uh, the uh, official uh, chestnut tree, le, le uh, Marronnier de la Treille, which is uh, here in Geneva. And this is the course of uh, temperature since the end of the 19th century until uh, roughly today. And you see we've uh, experienced uh, quite a lot of uh, changes, some uh, very warm periods towards the middle of the 20th century, the, f the 2003 heat wave standing out very clearly here. And then uh, essentially we've, we've gained a couple of degrees uh, here in Geneva over more than a century. And now we're gonna superimpose upon this uh, temperature graph the uh, day of the first flowering. And as you see, uh, we've uh, gained, or we've moved forward in, in the season uh, by about 20 or 30 days on average, maybe even more on certain specific years. So there seems to be uh, a fairly nice correlation between increases in temperature and earlier flowering of the chestnut tree. A more uh, detailed paper that was published a few years ago um, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society Biological Sciences actually shows a very long time series uh, going back to the 1750s in the UK uh, and uh, highlighting the average 25 year periods with these sort of horizontal lines here. So you see uh, some warming taking place after what we refer to it as the, uh, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. Uh, this is the flowering, uh, first flowering day for a, a combined set of more than 400 species. And as you see, uh, we have uh, later flowering in the uh, 1850s through to the early 1900s. Uh, a Early, earlier flowering in the early 1900s, and then fairly early flowering in the last couple of decades. And if we now look at the uh, temperature record for the, this uh, very long uh, period of more than 250 years, well, if we look carefully, for example, here we see that the uh, late flowering is indeed relatively well correlated with cooler temperatures, characteristic of the 1850s. This is at the time we were coming out of what we call the Little Ice Age. And then we have this uh, first warmer phase in the uh, 1900s that you saw on the uh, global temperature record a few minutes ago. And then the second phase of uh, very strong warming uh, in the latter uh, couple of decades. Okay, so that again, you see that uh, for different species combined together, even a, a sort of combination of more than 400 species does seem to be responding uh, to uh, changes in temperature and possibly also changes in in uh, moisture. Uh, and obviously, if we were to look at individual species, then some of the changes would be even more spectacular than the, these 400 combined species, which where you would have some sort of averaging of species that are not responding at all, other species that are responding more, more rapidly. Okay, let's have a look how uh, climate might actually uh, evolve over uh, coming uh, decades. And this is what is probably of importance when, uh, when thinking about how to respond to changes in precipitation and temperature patterns uh, over coming decades, especially in terms of management of, uh, of biomes and uh, uh, plant and tree species, even down to the individual scale of uh, botanical <coughs> gardens. So in order to look uh, to the future, we of course need to use what we call uh, climate models. And these are, sorry, These are based on the physics of the atmosphere, the physics of the oceans and so on. So what we do is we uh, try and uh, segment the globe in three dimensional cubes or volumes. And for each of these volumes, we will be applying the laws of physics, uh, defining fluid mechanics, uh, thermodynamics, uh, uh, radiation physics, looking at the role of clouds and precipitation, looking at the, how land uh, use and land uh, use changes interact with the climate system, and of course, the new actor in the game being the human actor, how the industrialization of the planet uh, via the emission of large quantities of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere 
has actually uh, changed a little bit, not only the chemistry of the climate system, but also, as we've seen uh, in uh, the first couple of view graphs, uh, how it's changed uh, some of the temperature and possibly moisture patterns. Indeed, if we um, look at what I, I consider to be maybe one of the most important uh, diagrams that was presented by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, the panel that received the Nobel Prize in 2007, um, what they did was to try and see what sort of causal links there might be between human activities and climate. Well, they took again the uh, long-term uh, average change of, of temperature of the 20th century. And then the first hypothesis was, well, maybe this has nothing to do with human activities. This might be uh, simply related to normal natural uh, factors that we know can affect the climate system, like changes in solar activity, volcanic activity that puts a lot of dust into the atmosphere and can cool the atmosphere for a few months to a couple of years, changes in sea surface temperatures and so on. And by using these physically based climate models, we, we try to reproduce the observed curve, taking into account only natural forcing factors, solar energy, volcanic activity, and so on. And what we see here, this is the result, these are the results of maybe about 30 different climate models. And so each model gives a little bit of a different response compared, compared to the neighboring model. This is why we have somewhat of a spread here. But what you see is that all models suggest that if we take into account only natural uh, forcing factors, then climate should be colder than what we observe. Now, if we add on to the natural factors, the enhanced greenhouse effect related to the fact that since the beginning of the industrial era a couple of hundred years ago, we've put in a lot of gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and so on. Well, if we uh, add the enhanced greenhouse effect related to human activities, then you see that we can correlate much better the observed and the simulated climate, uh, the simulated temperature curves, which means that uh, not only humans are uh, an actor in the uh, recent evolution of climate, but they might indeed be the dominant actor or might have been the dominant actor for over the last couple of uh, decades, since about the 1980s, since it's at this uh, bifurcation that you see that the uh, human factors seem to be dominating over the natural factors in terms of uh, uh, global changes in climate. So let's have a look what some of these climate models are suggesting for the future. Having made a little bit of a case for the causal links between human activities via greenhouse gas emissions, uh, what might be the uh, changes that we might experience over coming decades? Of course, we need these climate models that are based in the physics of the climate system. We also need a whole range of other uh, parameters to drive these models, especially socioeconomic parameters. What will be the uh, future population of the globe? What will be the uh, the type of industrialization that we'll be uh, imagining. Are we going to keep using coal and oil as a major source of energy? Or are we going to shift to renewables and so on? So basically trying to integrate societal changes into these models and see how the, these models might respond. So rather than develop just one possible future scenario, the IPCC developed actually about 40 different scenarios that uh, mix quite subtly uh, economic growth, for demographic change, uh, technological choice, and so on. So what I'll show you here is a sort of median uh, scenario. Uh, so what you'll see is this animation here of one of the IPCC models, and you see the dates of the 21st century going by. And basically what you see is a little bit like we saw for the NASA animation right at the start of the talk. A very noisy picture and no uniform warming because climate is being modulated by the distribution of continents and ocean, the presence or absence of ice, the presence or absence of vegetation. Uh, but basically what you see is a little bit what we saw uh, for the observed climate, a very strong warming in the polar regions, strong warming over the continents, less strong warming over the oceans, uh, simply because of the different heat capacities of these different systems. We can even come down to a more regional scale and look, for example, how the uh, threshold of extremely hot temperatures might actually change uh, over the uh, next uh, decade. So this is the reference period of the 20th century. And you see that the 40 degree uh, Celsius threshold was exceeded during these uh, 30 years, 1960s to the 1990s, essentially around the Mediterranean region, southern Spain, northern Africa, and so on. By the middle of this century, you see this northward shift, 
uh, of uh, the very hot uh, zones. And by the end of the 21st century, then you see that uh, Spain in particular and uh, southern Italy, Greece, uh, will experience anything up to 30 or, th or 35 more days per year with extremely hot temperatures compared to today's climate. And you see that the very hot days, 40 degrees Celsius, could even move as far north as the southern Baltic, where we've, of course, never experienced such hot temperatures up till now. Now, when we think about climate change, we think first and foremost about uh, temperature change, but many other elements of the system will also change, in particular precipitation. And this is also a rather difficult graph to see because it goes a little bit quickly, I guess. Uh, so you see the continents here, you see uh, the, the global turn. In blue, uh, increases in precipitation, in red, decreases in precipitation compared to today's climate. So you see again a very noisy picture. Some parts of the world will respond with increases in temperature, other parts uh, will uh, see declines in, in precipitation. Uh, so essentially, I would say the tropics will undergo declines in uh, humidity and the mid-latitudes essentially uh, increases in precipitation. Although we'll see that uh, some things might be even more subtle than on this graph. If I come down to the European scale, as I did for the temperature just a, a couple of minutes ago, we see that um, on average, summertime uh, precipitation in Europe is likely to decrease quite substantially. Uh, by anything up to 20 to 40 percent, according to where you are. Uh, the only region where we might see an increase in precipitation is uh, sort of nor uh, central to northern Norway, as uh, sort of storm tracks tend to move northwards um, compared to the uh, current tracks in, in today's world. Now, what's interesting here is the second graph that I'm going to show here is that despite the fact that Europe is likely to dry out on average, we might actually see at the same time an increase in very heavy precipitation events, those that can, you know, more than 50 millimeters per day, those can, that can uh, create uh, local flooding, or here in, in the Alps, for example, landslides, mudslides, and so on. So despite the fact that on average, uh, Europe might be drying out, we'll see also the other extreme of precipitation, that's to say very heavy precipitation, that might actually be on the increase in many parts of the continent. And of course, I don't have uh, too much time to go into the details of this, but there are physical explanations to explain this apparent paradox, an average drying out, but then at the same time, an increase in extremely heavy precipitation. Now we can also have a look beyond uh, climate, what some of the other determin determinants on vegetation survival might be. Of course, some of the, what I'm gonna show is linked to climate, but these are sort of the sort of second order effects beyond simple changes in temperature and precipitation. One being, of course, changes in global water availability. And you'll see on this animation, uh, especially Europe is going to undergo fairly major uh, changes if we are to believe uh, climate models. Europe is likely to be a hotspot of drought in coming decades, okay? And you see as you go northwards uh, into the high latitudes, you see increases in water availability. But essentially what we see in, in Europe is basically a sort of Mediterranean type climate, meaning very long, dry and warm summers uh, moving in uh, systematically, okay? So this is of course uh, something that needs to be taken into account when planning ahead, whether we're talking about agriculture or managing uh, different biomes uh, at different uh, geographic scales. Another element that was published a few years ago by the European a Environment Agency, which is also fairly interesting. Uh, this is the possible uh, changes in fire risk. Uh, this is today's uh, uh, picture with, of course, as you would expect in the Mediterranean zone, high risk of fire. And as we go towards the uh, second half of the 21st century, then as you would expect, because of the northward motion movement of Mediterranean regimes, then you can, of course, expect fire risk to increase. And if we look at the difference map, then you see it's the sort of mid-latitude Europe where the sensitivity of forest fires will be, will be the greatest. So not necessarily in the Mediterranean zone because forest fires are all, all already at its maximum, so it can't change very much. But as we go uh, into mid-latitude Europe and as far as southern Scandinavia, this is where the fire risk is likely to be even more important than, than today. And there may be a third uh, element that uh, might be uh, of importance when managing uh, 
um, uh, different uh, biomes, uh, and especially forests. Uh, this is the possible change in windstorms. Now, you may remember uh, we've had a, a series in the last 20 years, 25 years, of fairly major windstorms. Uh, maybe some of you might remember the low tower windstorm that uh, hit uh, from Brittany through to Central Europe and damaged uh, or destroyed in the part of Versailles, for example, near Paris, uh, uh, trees that were sort of centuries old, okay? Uh, so, uh, of course, it is of interest to see how these uh, extremely strong, strong windstorms might actually change in frequency and possibly intensity in the future. So what you see on this diagram here, and this is based on a, on, on a range of different models uh, compiled by the European a Environment Agency, we do see a, a possible increase from the British Isles, northern France, and on into the southern Baltic, increase in the uh, frequency of so and magnitude of some of these storms, whereas the Mediterranean region is likely to see a decline in storminess. Of course, just to give you an idea, uh, uh, this is the kind of damage uh, that storms can actually do. This is, this is one of the results of the Lothar windstorm, uh, not very far from here at the other end of the Lake of Geneva, uh, and you have the impression that these are not trees, these are just match, matches, matchsticks that, we, that were just broken uh, as if by magic. Okay, so uh, windstorms are, of course, uh, an extremely damaging factor for uh, especially trees, I would say. Now, another aspect that is indirectly linked to uh, climate change is al also invasive species that might, through competi competition, with different um, sort of native uh, plant species uh, might actually uh, damage the, uh, the, the native plants. Uh, okay, one, one species which is not necessarily, uh, which is an invasive uh, species, uh, especially um, of concern for people who are uh, alle alle allergic to pollen is uh, ragweed or ambrosia. Um, which is uh, invading many parts of Europe at the moment. And what we see is the current distribution of ragweed, so uh, fairly high distribution from anywhere from uh, France, uh, in Italy, around the Mediterranean region into, into Eastern uh, Europe and as far uh, east as uh, Western Russia. And according to the changes, not only in climate, but the um, appropriateness of soils and uh, uh, for hosting the, the uh, ragweed, uh, this is what the future distribution could actually look like. So what you see is actually a shift northeastward. So you see ragweed distribution might not quite be quite as uh, uh, abundant as it is today in places like Western France, because climate conditions might actually go beyond a certain threshold uh, for the viability of ragweed, uh, of ragweed. Whereas if you go into the uh, Baltic region and on into Western Russia, you see a high, uh, a high uh, rate of change of the distribution of ragweed. Now, whether ragweed is uh, of uh, concern to native plants is something that I let you um, uh, discuss. Uh, what we are simply showing here is that invasive species need also to be taken into account when thinking about how to adapt to a changing climate. It's not just a matter of changing temperatures and precipitation, it's a matter of water availability, it's a matter of changing storminess, fire risk, and the possibility that invas invasive species might also be uh, sort of part of the game in the future. The same for insect uh, pests, uh, and again, this is uh, a recent study that was made <coughs> of the invasion of a mosquito species. Again, this is not necessarily going to affect plants uh, but it's just to show you how once a species starts to appear in a part of the world, and this is uh, the uh, Italian-speaking part of uh, Switzerland, uh, Ticino, this is the uh, distribution of the species in 2003. This was the very uh, massive heat wave that we had. Uh, 2005, just a couple of years later, and you might just start to see a couple of little red spots, but don't look too hard because it's going to be much more spectacular uh, as we move along. So a couple of years later, you see on the border with Italy, at the extreme south of the canton of Ticino, you start to see the occurrence of this insect uh, species. And as we go uh, further forward in time, then you see the extremely rapid 
um, uh, rate of change uh, of uh, appearance of the species. It's a very slow process at the start, and it increases almost exponentially. Okay, and again, as I say, this is a mosquito species, probably not detrimental to plants, as far as I know, but it just shows you uh, that other insect pests might follow the same course because of a, of a changing climate that is, becomes more and more appropriate for, the, um, for, the, uh, for hosting uh, such pests that were not present until the uh, early part of this century in this part of the, of the world. Now just to show you, uh, and this is also based on work uh, inter alia by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, looking at some of the potential impact on vegetation. Uh, this is some, actually this is some work we, we did at our institute a few years ago. <coughs> just looking at the beginning of the end and end of the vegetation cycle in lowland Switzerland. So for temperatures that go beyond five degrees Celsius, uh, for the reference period of the 20th century that we usually consider to be the, the baseline, this is the 1960s to 1990s period, we have about 250 days per year, which is viable, for example, for agriculture and for other forms of, uh, of vegetation. By the end of this century, you see that almost all the year will be uh, theoretically viable uh, for uh, the vegetation cycle. And looking at the massive heat wave that we had in 2003, uh, we see that we had uh, uh, more than 280 days uh, uh, where we exceeded this five degree uh, Celsius threshold. And indeed we can also uh, look in terms of growing degree days beyond this five degree threshold. For the reference period of the 20th century, it's <coughs> almost 3,500 degree days. By the end of the century, it will be almost 5,000 degree days, which is a, a, an, a, an increase of about uh, 50%. And in 2003, we had about 4,100 degree days, uh, an increase of 20% uh, over the uh, baseline uh, reference uh, period. So this is, of course, simply in terms of temperature. This does not take into account, this does not factor in uh, possible changes in humidity. So of course, you still need to keep moisture available in a much warmer world if you want different forms of vegetation uh, to continue to be viable, whether it's agricultural crops or whether it's different uh, plant species, natural plant species. Now I'm taking this example <coughs> because it's, um, it was uh, also carried out uh, just uh, last year by some uh, colleagues at uh, one of the agricultural research um, organizations uh, in Nancy in France. <clears throat> this is the current distribution of uh, vegetation. So very broadly speaking, you have in red the Mediterranean type of species. In blue, uh, or different forms of blue montane species, you have the sort of uh, warm Atlantic region or the Aquitaine region, if you like, the cooler Atlantic region moving into sort of the Paris uh, uh, region and, and northern France. And then you have uh, vegetation char more characteristic of what could be considered to be a little bit continental Europe, so what you, this would continue on into, into Germany and into, into, the, into the Central Europe, for example. As we move forward in time, according to the projected changes in both temperature and precipitation, uh, this is what might be expected. <coughs> and intuitively, one could expect uh, vegetation bands to move northwards uh, to try and keep track with the northward movement of uh, temperature patterns. And by the end of this century, then you see Mediterranean type of, uh, <coughs> of plants that are today confined uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, close to the Mediterranean uh, Sea, move uh, into um, many parts of the southern half of France, if you like. So uh, probably 40% of uh, future French um, vegetation will be characteristic of uh, Mediterranean type vegetation, whereas today it's roughly maybe 20, 15 to 20 percent only. So this is in terms of uh, latitudinal shifts. Uh, what is also, uh, what can be of interest is to see the altitudinal shifts as well. And this is a fairly uh, old study, I would say, maybe about 15 years old that I'll be showing you with a little animation. So before I, I'm, I put the animation on the screen, what we're going to see are the changes from the mid-19th century to the, f to the end of this century, to 2100. 
And what you'll see is, of course, an upward shift of vegetation, trying to keep track with the upward movement of uh, temperature and possibly precipitation. But what you'll also see is the uh, disappearance of certain uh, plant species. Because as we have uh, a very rapid change in climate, <coughs> the most robust species, sorry. <coughs> it's only the most robust species that will be able to keep track of the rapid change in climate. So there'll be a competition between species uh, and uh, only the more uh, adaptive species will be able to keep uh, alive, if I, if I may say, uh, compared to the less adapti adaptive species. And this is what this uh, animation will show us. So this is uh, a study that was done uh, a few years ago in uh, Glacier National Park. And you see as time goes by, uh, climate warms up. You see the glaciers at the top and the snow fields disappearing and being uh, replaced progressively by different spe types of uh, vegetation species. But what you also notice, hopefully on this animation, I'll, I'll run it through maybe a second time, is that you lose many of the sort of yellow to red colors compared to today. And you have essentially one or two major species that will dominate over all the other species. So the competition between species is also something that will need to be taken into account when planning for the management of uh, different biomes from fairly large geographic scales down, I would say, even to the scales of a botanical garden. Okay, I think I'm coming roughly to the end of my talk here, so I maybe just uh, end up with a couple of concluding remarks. The first one is, well, we know that climate uh, has a long inertia built into it. And even if we were to implement fully the uh, Paris Climate Accord, the COP21 agreement, uh, well, climate is still going to warm uh, over coming decades, whatever we do, okay? So we'll need to adapt in different uh, domains to this changing climate, while at the same time trying to address the sort of ultimate goal that is to keep climate uh, change, if we believe in the Climate Accord, to less than two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial values. So this is gonna be a major challenge, especially for vegetation, which as you fully know better than me, uh, some types of vegetation have a fairly large environmental bandwidth and can adapt uh, fairly easily to even large changes in environmental and climate conditions, whereas other species might have much less adaptive capacity. So the challenge is gonna be how to conserve the uh, less adaptive species in the face of a rapidly changing uh, climate. Now, of course, um, uh, this is, you're, you're much more expert than I am, but uh, I, I visited last year, I was in Singapore for, for a meeting and visited the very spectacular greenhouses which are actually air conditioned. So they're able to, re in one of the greenhouses, they were actually able to reproduce uh, a rainforest type of uh, environment as uh, they have in neighboring Sumatra, for example. And in the second greenhouse, uh, which I think is one of the largest in the world uh, today, uh, looking at different biomes from Mediterranean type through to the sort of Australian desert type of biomes. So it is technically possible, but of course at very high cost, I would imagine, simply to build these greenhouses and the energy that is necessary to maintain these greenhouses uh, at uh, the temperatures necessary for these different uh, plant species to survive within this uh, um, artificial environment. But this is maybe what is going to be necessary, at least for certain plant species, uh, in terms of uh, conservation measures uh, in the face of a changing climate. Okay, with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. I finished with this photograph that I took in another botanical garden. Uh, I was at a meeting in Hong Kong this year, which was also very fascinating. And they have a very nice uh, botanical garden as well, uh, with, of course, uh, native species, uh, including uh, these very special orchids. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, for, uh, Professor Beniston. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, please. 
Could you, could you give your yeah. name as well, please? Ma Mats Hofström from uh, Sweden. Uh, in, in Sweden, we, we know that many of the species that, that are, uh, are vulnerable to climate change, they, they exist in very fragmented po uh, populations. And we see that each little population just decreases and have no ability to, to move to, to higher latitudes, etc. Is this something, uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's the same thing in France, for instance, with the Mediterranean vegetation. If, if you want that to, to move northwards in, in France, uh, land use will be a major obstacle for many of the species. Uh, I know this was discussed in the IPCC when I was working with this in the, in the 90s. Uh, but I don't see it in uh, any of the models, the abilities of, of biota to actually move and follow these uh, latitudinal uh, shifts in vegetation. Do, do you have any comment on this? Well, maybe, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. What I should have said when I was showing you the um, different maps of France is that this is the theoretical range of, uh, uh, of uh, distribution of these different uh, biomes, okay? This does not mean that they will necessarily actually colonize uh, these regions. So this is the viability map, if you like, but not necessarily the future vegetation map. And I think uh, trying to actually uh, uh, estimate where vegetation will actually be able to go, what it will actually colonize in the future, uh, this is probably a second and much more complicated step than trying to de define what would be the range of viability of these species in the future. Also an interesting, uh, what I didn't show you, I had a, a couple of other examples, but in the interest of time, um, you mentioned that y um, some of the species simply cannot move northwards. Uh, when you have uh, plant species that are already at the m uh, margins, either of a continent, I'm thinking, for example, of South Africa, uh, which is one of the hotspots of biodiversity in the region of the Cape of Good Hope, uh, any change in climate that would sort of move uh, from the north to the south uh, in the southern hemisphere uh, would basically push a lot of species off the edge of the Cape of Good Hope, right? They don't have anywhere to, m where to move, okay? If they can't adapt on the spot, then they can't move south because they'll fall into the ocean, basically. The same with uh, vegetation that is close to the tops of mountains here in the Alps or in other uh, major mountain chains of the world. If, uh, if you have um, upward moving pressures from climate and from competing vegetation species, then of course the, the species that are already at the top of the mountains, if they cannot adapt on the spot, they'll go extinct because they cannot move upwards for obvious reasons. Emi Sudarmanawati from Indonesia. I wonder whether you have conducted collaboratively um, study on uh, uh, concerning the tropical countries um, uh, forest fire because uh, recently um, it's even the effect more uh, damaging because of uh, El Nino or something. Right, right. Thank you. Well, personally, I, I haven't dealt with the uh, sort of tropical climates. Uh, there are quite a few uh, research groups around the, around the world actually doing that. And as you rightly mentioned, El Nino is a major factor affecting uh, forest fires, it, it, hans it enhances sorry, the uh, risk of fire, especially in your part of the world, in uh, places like Queensland in Australia and so on. And uh, of course, trying to pre predict the uh, El Nino events would be one way or is one way of trying to avoid uh, or to adapt in advance to uh, what we know will be increases in fire risks in, in many parts of the uh, Pacific region. We have another question, thank you. Yes, do not hold my question against this audience because I am a complete outsider. I am just a silly journalist whom the uh, organizer kindly allowed to sit in this conference. Like everyone, I uh, assume in this room, I totally believe everything you told us. And still, I am confronted with the following paradox. Most people who share your views do not do so for scientific reasons. They do it because Martin Beniston and all academia and prestigious UN agency say so. Whereas when you discuss with climatosceptics, you are struck 
by the fact that although probably they are in error, they have an acute sense of scientific debate. And I want as a proof of that, if you ask people in any pollution, climate or energy workshop why CO2 acts as a lead against outgoing warmth and not as a screen against incoming sunlight, most people say, I don't know. Of course, there is an explanation, you know it, but most people Excuse just we, support we the truth from conformism, and if you want to keep your scientific mind, sometimes you have to go into error. Was that a question or was that a comment? <laughs> yes, how do you react to the fact that most of your supporters probably do not have a scientific mind, at least much less than your uh, uh, challenges? Well, I think the only way to, to counteract uh, climate skeptics and scientific skeptics in general is to try and provide the best uh, available science to counteract their arguments. Thank you very much. I think we need to, to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Merci Professor